Did you know that in the 1980s, New Zealand was almost broken? Well, our next guest has a lot to say about that turnaround, and it's a very exciting story, so please stay tuned. Big topics, big ideas, and practical policy solutions. This is Leaders on the Frontier with your host, David Lees. Well, welcome everybody. Did you know that in the 1980s, New Zealand was in big trouble? In fact, many said at the time that New Zealand was broken. Large deficits, big debts, and an awful lot of broken confidence and trust that New Zealand as a country could move forward. Our next guest is um, an expert and authority in that regard. He was the finance minister with a team of people with the then prime minister to be able to turn that situation around. We're so grateful today to welcome a friend of Frontier, um, the great Sir Roger Douglas uh, from uh, New Zealand uh, today. Welcome, uh, Roger. Uh, it's great to be here. Well, Roger, we're uh, delighted that you could join us today. And I, I just want to um, ask if you could just help us set the stage. What was really going on in New Zealand at that time? Was it an overstatement to say that uh, New Zealand was broken? Was it was it going bankrupt? What was going on? No, we were close to being broke. Um, we had a huge fiscal deficit. We had a huge uh, overseas deficit. Um, we were trying to prop everybody up. So we had subsidies for farmers, subsidies in a different form for manufacturers. You name it, um, uh, we had put it in place. So, you know, farmers uh, paid high taxes in order to subsidise manufacturers. Manufacturers paid high taxes in order to subsidise farmers. It was crazy. Wow. So in that context, like if you were a, um, a, a typical citizen in New Zealand, how did you experience that? Was the cost of living high? What was it like? Well, certainly the cost of living was high. Uh, in fact, uh, we had, uh, uh, or Muldoon tried to defy it by having a, a price freeze for a couple of years with an interest rate uh, freeze, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, none of that uh, worked. Uh, and uh, we just built up to the situation where uh, if we didn't change, we were going to go broke. Um, if you wanted me to sum up uh, how we uh, turned it round, I'd say that what we did was get rid of privilege. And quite often when you look at countries that want to make fundamental changes, it, it, the essence of those changes is often uh, getting rid of privileges. And okay, getting so that's rid of, fascinating. So when you say getting rid of privilege, you mean well, the privilege of special interests or, or yeah, group? Yeah, the privilege of the vested interests. So in New Zealand, uh, what we did, we got rid of uh, subsidies to farmers. I mean, farmers were paid an extra dollar for every lamb they had and things like that. Uh, and so we did that. On the manufacturing side, we got rid of privilege um, in terms of um, import controls. We had lots of import controls. So only certain goods could only be manufactured in New Zealand. We had high tariff protection, uh, things of that nature. But it's wrong to think that privilege only goes uh, to the wealthy or to manufacturing or farming. Privilege also uh, was removed in terms of some of the unions and their power um, because they also want those sort of controls if they can get it. And, and so you saw privilege being removed uh, pretty much across the board. Wow. So you were the finance minister during that time you came in during um, the election in the 1980s. When exactly was that election and, and how did you feel uh, the Prime Minister of the day and that team um, had a mandate to make change? How did that come about? Well, 
I think change was frankly inevitable. Uh, you need to remember that the day we arrived, the banks were closed to foreign exchange transactions. So that uh, ensures that you actually focus your mind. And I think we were lucky. We were lucky in two ways. I think we had an exceptional cabinet. Uh, and if you think about uh, that, the one thing that was exceptional about it was not only did we realize that there were, we were, as a country, we were in a lot of trouble, we also recognized that we needed to do something about it. And in doing something about it, we would possibly uh, lose the next election. We actually realized that we couldn't win in terms of what was good for the country if we weren't prepared to lose in terms of what might have been politically good. And I think well, that, that's, that's, that's that was, amazing. That, that was something that was unique. We didn't talk about it, but just basically people realized that. I think our uh, two historians in the cabinet, both of who taught or lectured at uh, Auckland University, they probably uh, were, they both um, thought we'd probably lose the election. You can't do these things, Roger, uh, and, and, and expect to win. Uh, but deep down, I always felt, and I know that there were others in the cabinet who felt that there was a lot of common sense out there amongst the ordinary public, that they make hard decisions um, every day of their life. Uh, you know, uh, more food on the table or education. They, they, they're used to trade-offs. Uh, wow. And so uh, that's like kind of an extraordinary story and insight because so often the perception of many politicians is it just it's a, it's kind of a game it's about money power and staying in office regardless of frankly the principles whereas you it sounds like your team came in with a a real sense of commitment and courage to the point where you said you know what we just may not get the next election is that right absolutely and i think we were helped in that we had an exceptional uh, group of people in the in the civil service at that time uh, certainly I, I just don't think uh, they they do in New Zealand uh, to the same degree at the moment uh, and that helped I mean um, uh, they uh, had done a lot of work in terms of how this um, the government's uh, trading organization for example should be run and so we saw enormous efficiency gains in that regard. Wow. Well, it's, it's fascinating because um, within the literature, with books, all kinds of articles, there's been a lot of attention um, on you because you, you had a pivotal role as the Minister of Finance. And in fact, I think your approach to governing, like empowering individuals with choice, and, and you even use the phrase getting rid of privilege of vested interests, um, it was described as Roger Economics or Roger Romic. Oh, oh, that was uh, someone in the uh, the press, I think, uh, came up with that uh, title because there was Thatcherism and oh, yes. economics, and it was just, you know it was an in thing at the time to right. put a name. Yeah. On. So, can you tell us a little bit more detail how you summarize? summarize Rogernomics. Well, I, I, I think in some ways I've already done that in the mm -hmm. sense that we remove privilege, and and that was a, you know right across the board. Uh, that meant getting rid of import licensing. Got meant lowering tariffs. It meant lowering personal tax. So you know we got rid of a lot of expenditures, subsidies to farmers subsidies to manufacturing and with the money that we freed up uh, we lowered personal tax we lowered personal tax from a top rate of 66 cents and the dollar to 33 in other words we halved it so some of the changes uh, were, were quite dramatic really uh, wow. and we we reorganized the public service uh, um, there were when we came into office, um, you know, there was uh, 
hierarchy, all these things. It was never a merit thing, uh, etc. It, it tended to be how long you'd been uh, it within the public service. Within the public service, uh, um, one of the things um, we did was people were appointed for five years. They weren't there for life. Uh, if, if someone was to be appointed the head of, say, education department, they were appointed for five years. They didn't necessarily get reappointed, uh, etc. We the, there was a situation where the pay was already predetermined. The secretary of the treasury got you know a couple of hundred dollars more than the secretary of trade, and, and so you had that uh, hierarchical system, and we got rid of that. Oh well. Wow. So I'd like to explore with you, uh, Sir Roger, a number of those reform areas. And if we could go through them quickly, I'm thinking of, um, well, let's say education. How did you transform education in New Zealand? I don't think we did. Um, oh, is that right? Not really. I think we introduced uh, we a voucher did. system or that kind of approach. Is that correct? No, we, um, we, we certainly... Uh, reduce the size of the education department. Um, we probably cut it in half in terms of its size, uh, but uh, the problem is, you know, that 30 years later, uh, the education department is probably bigger and more bureaucratic than it ever was. And it really brings you down to the, the nature of the change. In some areas, it was fundamental and nothing, uh, you know, it, 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 it was fundamental change and those changes uh, stayed in place. But generally, uh, in the social policy area, um, whilst there were changes, uh, they weren't fundamental. And that's really where Longy and I uh, fell apart. Uh, I wrote a chapter in my book, um, that I wrote about, oh, I think two or three months before the 1987 election. Um, and the, it was the last chapter in the book, Ends and Means, and it, that was about uh, what still needed to be done uh, mm. in the welfare area, that we had to bring more choice, uh, et cetera, to it. Uh, so but is long that the book that you're referring to as Unfinished Business? Is that the book yeah. that says hey, we've made a lot of changes, but we needed to go further? Um, no, that one was in 87, Toward Prosperity. So it was published in March 87. We had an election in, um, uh, yeah, July of that year, July or August of that year. Uh, and um, I had that, uh, it was really, 19 chapters saying what a great government we were and the last chapter was saying hey we still have things to do and okay. the things i highlighted were health uh, education and, and the reform of the social policy area so sir roger just to pick up on the themes of reform then what would you say are the key areas of reform that um, turned new zealand around Oh, I, I think um, a lot more competition, uh, getting rid of uh, privileges, getting rid of all the subsidies and tax breaks, uh, uh, getting the incentives right. Um, and, and that enabled us, uh, getting rid of the subsidies and tax breaks, all that, to lower tax. And, and, and it made New Zealand a, a much more attractive place. Um, it, I'm not saying it was easy. We took uh, some pretty big hits. At one stage, we had uh, interest rates on housing at 20%. Um, you know, the electorate um, wasn't very keen about that. But in the end, the electorate understood uh, that we were in trouble uh, and, um, and voted for us uh, to finish the job. And I'm not oh. sure whether they were keen on us finishing the job or they recognised, uh, hey, that uh, 
if we didn't finish the job, it was going to get even worse. Okay, so so just to clarify, you made a lot of tough decisions. Like you sold off, we refer to them in Canada as crown corporations, uh, like Absolutely. state organizations and all those things. And I think people would be shocked to know that you were with a labor government. I thought labor government was about socialism and a big state, not a little one. But you took a different approach to that. How did you do that? Well, again, um, it was generally sold un under the umbrella of that we were getting, you know, rid of privilege. And when you can, and, and I know I come back to that a bit, but, you know, we, we had to get rid of some of the privileges of the trade union movement. And uh, some of the trade union movement were people who were on the executive of the Labour Party, and then they were the final uh, point of uh, all the power lay. But in a way, they found it difficult uh, to argue against that. And okay. it's right to take farmers' privileges, manufacturers' privileges, if you're not prepared to take away the privilege of the union and other vested interest groups like, well, if you're talking about unions, it's probably the teachers' union. Uh, one of the strongest, uh, and um, that still needs to be attended. By the way, wow. no, I, I just think it's a it's a profound insight that you're really laying on the table here. This profound lesson of history is that if you look at all these vested interests and their associated privilege, um, that that gives you some clues about how you need to go about public policy to actually better serve the people. Isn't that right? I think quite often it. The, the essence of reform is the removal of privilege. But you have to, there's a lot of other elements. Uh, what some of the lessons we learned was that only quality changes work. You know, if you compromise on the quality of the change you make, in the end, it comes back to bite you. Uh, you need to act with speed. Uh, you definitely need to think about uh, the changes as a package because it's unfair, for example, for us to take the subsidies away from the farmers if we weren't prepared to open up um, the available of the goods they needed to be efficient. So getting rid of import licensing, lowering tariffs, that was a trade-off. And people came to realise um, that whilst they were adversely affected by the removal of their privilege, they benefited, in fact, from the removal of privileges elsewhere uh, in, the, uh, in the country. Okay, so that's fascinating. So it's not just the kind of changes that you made or what changes were made. It's how you went about it and those lessons learned. So you... like. Would you, would you say that in terms of lessons learned then, um, would you say speed was a very important strategy that you undertook? Well, I think speed was, was one element. Um, I mean, you, you, you need to, to get through it. And um, I can always remember farmers would come to meetings and they would be critical, but they'd their spirits would go up if uh, we acted uh, and, for example, removed, lowered tariffs further, for example, uh, because they knew they benefited. So uh, it was a package, but uh, important elements of it were... Okay. So they, can you tell us a little bit more about the benefits of those changes and how that was realised? And I know that as a, as a young person, I remember watching this from a distance and, and really being, frankly, um, pleasantly surprised that New Zealand had the leadership to undertake these changes. And all of a sudden, I know years later, you started even seeing all kinds of New Zealand products in the grocery store, like New Zealand lamb and, and all kinds of things. And it's like New Zealand became a powerhouse. So what were those benefits of those changes that you saw up close within New Zealand? Well, you mentioned lamb. Uh, you need to remember that with Muldoon subsidising lamb, giving people a, 
uh, an extra pound or in those days uh, uh, for uh, the, the, every lamb they produced um, out of government coffers. Um, we went from producing 60,000 lambs down to 25. But, the, but you know who benefited from the, those subsidies and the, the production of 65? You'd think our country would. But in fact, the price was next to nothing. And it was Iran that benefited most. They love lamb. And whatever surplus we You're had, saying the country Iran? Hmm? Iran. Sorry, you're saying the country Iran. Wow, that's interesting. And, and they come in, they buy virtually the last 20,000 lambs or whatever uh, at next to nothing. And uh, we, we got rid of um, those subsidies. The result was the number of lambs produced dropped dramatically, but the price the farmer received went up three or four times and 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 the farmer learned what the market wanted the market did not want fat lambs because hmm. if you got paid by the number of lambs and their weight you you produce fat ones but the market didn't want that so the so the farmers um, became uh, pretty clever and uh, they learned what the market then wanted, and they produced what the market wanted. Wow, what, what a powerful example. Um, so when you look at um, selling the ch kind of changes that you made, did the changes kind of sell themselves, or did you use particular types of strategies to employ these kinds of major, uh, major changes? Well, certainly... Uh, Look, I don't know that uh, fundamentally we sat down and worked out uh, our strategies a long way ahead, but we had some rules. I mean, if we were going to make changes, we tried to signal what those changes were ahead of time. Um, we tried to spell them out in detail. We tried to tell people what was good about them and why we had to make the changes. But we'd also tell them what the downside was from their perspective. And I think overall, um, the public appreciated that. And of wow. course, what I think helped, people enjoyed the additional choice they had, uh, competition, uh, we created competition, so there were more opportunities and people wanted uh, to try to take advantage of that. So when we look at those kinds of changes, um, I'm, I'm fascinated that why would you, as a minister within a socialist government, advocate so strongly for those kinds of changes when, in fact, a lot of your constituents, like I, I'm thinking union leaders to people in large institutions would have really been dare I say, uh, threatened by those kinds of changes. That must have been very difficult. Well, I'll, I'll come back with a story there, but um, the, I, I think you, the, the cabinet as a whole, or generally, understood that we were not there to serve the vested interest. Uh, we weren't there to um, serve the interest of um, the teachers union or the or the health workers union we were there to do what was best for individual New Zealanders and if we did that we could create a climate where teachers and and health workers and everyone else could benefit but only if they served the interests of the consumer and I think that that was important um, when I did my first budget in 1984, I think it was November 84, about three months after um, we, the general election that we won in August, um, you know, we, we did some pretty tough things. We uh, 
we put electricity prices up uh, because they'd been subsidised. We we did a whole lot of the sort of sort of thing, and and we had a meeting on the Monday uh, with all the interest group. We invited the farmers, we invited the manufacturers, the whole everyone, the people from the transport union and what have you. And you know, at the end of the day, there was only people from the transport industry who thought the fact that I'd put up road user charges by 48% that this was a bit rough. But it was the other people in the audience who'd come to realise that whilst they had lost their privilege, the farmers lost subsidy, manufacturers all of a sudden didn't have a monopoly rights in some area, they all realised that they also gained. And, and, they, and, and you know, they told this guy from the transport um, sector, forget it, you, you know, we're all in this together and... Um, this is in the interest of the country, and in the long run, it's in the interest of um, New Zealand. Wow, what a great story. It, it just powerfully illustrates that history about how, with that kind of approach to empowering individuals to make their choices and, and really building on freedom that, and markets, that you were able to better serve the people of New Zealand. And there was a unity in doing that as a team. It's, it's really a remarkable story. And so since that history, you have shared really in many ways the lessons learned from structural reform or Roger, um, Rogernomics around the world. And one of the parties that you shared that story with was with none other than um, the president of Frontier named Peter Hawley. And I know Peter has facilitated this conversation, but do you remember how that contact with Frontier happened um, so many years ago? I believe I was invited to speak at uh, a conference uh, on pr on privatisation. Uh, it was in Saskatchewan. Saskatoon. Or Saskatoon. And uh, Peter, for his sins, uh, uh, was uh, told that he had to look after me, which is always a difficult job. <laughs> Uh, we've been friends ever since. No, it's it's a great story because clearly um, the story of, of reform happens through not just thinking, but through human relationship. And in this case, um, we know that um, part of Peter's own story was that he was working as a uh, advisor uh, with the province of Saskatchewan, with the Honourable Grant Devine, the premier then, who made right. a lot of changes. And uh, it's almost like... Um, those lessons have been taught to so many others. That must be really heartening to you as you look around the world where people were picking up on the kind of leadership that you uh, gave as an example. Well, to the extent that uh, that occurred, uh, you know, uh, any move in, that is a move in the right direction is good not only for the country that is undertaking, it's good for everyone else. Can I just make one other point about our changes? And I think this is important, that helped us a lot. Um, we had, at that ta stage, the New Zealand Roundtable. Now, the Re New Zealand Roundtable was an organisation that had the biggest companies uh, in New Zealand as part of it. And they'd really started as a lobby group, you know, what's in our interests, and they'd meet. Um, but around the time when we were elected before that, um, they had appointed uh, Roger Kerr to um, be their chief executive. And during that period of time, he'd been a former Treasury officer, and so uh, he, he was up with the play. But he educated those business people that what was in the interest of the country was what was really important to their companies. So when we were making these changes, we had half a dozen uh, top New Zealand business people who were out there making speeches explaining why the changes we were making were important to the country. And I think that helped uh, 
uh, enormously. And, and the other thing which they did, uh, when we were reforming the state-owned enterprises, the Forestry Corporation, the Coal Corporation, the Electricity, they actually went in and, and onto the boards and some of them were chairman of the board. And that helped us uh, enormously to turn around those businesses. Take forestry, for example, which um, Alan Gibbs went into. Uh, in the last year when they were a government department, uh, we spent $187 million in forestry. That was, I two years later, uh, along with Richard Preble, we got a, a check from Alan Gibbs for $137 million. Now that's not a bad turnaround when you're talking about a company that probably had sales of only six or 700 million. Wow, so that's a very powerful lesson learned, isn't it, Sir Roger, that within every kind of sector within New Zealand society, you had a special circle of leaders that were really raising awareness. You even used the word educating. Uh, I mean, that's certainly a big part of the mission of Frontiers, really to educate people around good public policy. And that's really not a, a partisan exercise. It's really about principles. It's not about polls. It's about principles. And it seems to me that that's part of the inspiring example here is that you've, you, you, this is an example of principled leadership. Is that right? Yes, um, I wonder whether it's possible to do it today uh, mm. as easily because most of these people were the owners of their own businesses. So they owned it. They just weren't the chief executive uh, as Dougie Miles was of Lion Brewery or Alan Gibbs of Freightways. These were people who owned the companies. And um, so... The, Whereas today, a lot of these big companies, uh, the CEO has been appointed there, but they don't have a big shareholding in it. And whether they would make or can make the same uh, decisions or speak out in that way, I'm not too sure. I wish well, they would. Very... I wish they would in New Zealand today, but they don't seem to. Yeah, but this is a very important observation as we look now to today and say, well, what are the lessons learned and how do we look at the kind of myriad of issues and challenges we face today? And I'm sure you, I know you have many observations. And so one of the questions I did want to pick up on is the whole theme of leadership. And that is, how do we develop um, good leaders within public service? Um, in the sense that within the Canadian context, and I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it seems like there's a lot of political representatives that really have, um, dare I say, quite limited experience. And I don't quite know the scene as certainly you do in New Zealand, but it seems like a common pattern where you have many persons in political office that have really have a very limited experience. They've never run a large company. They've never uh, done much else other than to be, say, a ministerial aide, and then they go on to political office themselves. Um, is that a common concern that you share as well? And how do Absolutely. we develop better leadership? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, the career pattern seems to be uh, you go to university, you're often very bright, uh, you uh, become a union leader within the university students association um, you get a good uh, pass at university you go on and you go into a minister's office or you go to into the join a union or you join the political party uh, maybe into their research unit or some such thing then you become a member of parliament uh, but often uh, you don't have uh, a lot of balance in 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 your background and uh, and and that reflected on the decision making yeah because in that sense if you have a very limited background dare i say it's almost entirely academic or um and i i use the 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 word um uh on purpose but if it's kind of a privileged background 
how do you have any common sense? How are you grounded in reality um, of, of how these decisions impact real people? Well, I don't know to the answer to that. Uh, quite obviously, um, many of them uh, have been through university. Uh, they've never actually worked in, in a business that has to sell pro a product in order to be able to pay you. Uh, they've worked for the government or some other organisation uh, where they have apparent security uh, and um, they make uh, those decisions accordingly. And, exactly. uh, but it's not only in the left, unfortunately. Primarily it is in the left, but uh, it just doesn't work, I'm afraid. Exactly. So as you reflect on these kinds of changes and as we look to today, why is this topic or why has this kind of work been for you so important? What, what's really at stake when you, when you step back and look at it and say, well, why would we go through all the hassle of trying to, frankly, reform um, on an almost bankrupt country? It's really quite, a, quite a, uh, uh, an enormous undertaking. What, what was really at stake behind this in your mind? Well, I think, um, I mean, if, if, if I'm in part politics, um, what is my goal? What is my objective? The only real objective I should have is to act in the interest of the nation as I see it. Now, I can be wrong, but you need to have that as your goal. Too many people go into politics uh, where um, they're tied, if you like, to a politi particular political party. And I think one of the things about my career, probably not necessarily a good one, is that I um, wasn't um, tied so much to the political party. I always try to act in the interest of what I thought was the interest of the country. And I got sacked a few times for doing that. You know, I did a, um, a book... Uh, in the 1970s and I wrote various papers and I was on the front bench of the Labor Party but you know because I did this and it wasn't Labor Party policy and uh, the leader didn't like it and 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 that's you know quite important factor I think in you talking about the, the, the people I mean I, my, I remember Mike Moore who was uh, head of uh, trade um, World Trade Organization. He was in our cabinet, and Mike wasn't very well for a while, and recently died. And I used to go and see him once a month, or Michael Basser, and um, we'd talk about things, and we, and I'd say, well, Mike, if 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 you believe that, what? Why are you um, so still tied to the Labor Party so close? He says, Roger, I'm tribal. And, and you know, that's what a lot of politicians, they're tribal. Mm. You know, they're Democrats right or wrong or, or liberal right or wrong. Whereas mm -hmm. you want more people, I think, in politics yeah. who make a judgment and are prepared to stand up and say what they really believe. I think it's Thomas Sowell, was it? If you want to help people, you tell them the truth. If you want to help yourself you tell them what they want to hear. Exactly. And too, and too many politicians are telling people, they poll, they tell people what they, what the polls uh, have told them they want to hear, and and as a result, the country gets nowhere. Well said. So they're, they're following polls, they're, 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 they're focused on the short term that we're losing sight of the principles at stake and what needs to be done, and not to sound... Um, empty or rhetorical, you need to do the right thing here. Otherwise, we'll lose our country. And that's, yeah, I think, well, part you of know, the they, they fine They fine tune their image. So the poll next week, they'll, it will show them in an improved position. Well, I mean, it's rubbish, really, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. You've so, got to ask yourself a very important question. This is one of the important questions, I think. Why am I in politics? 
Well said. If you're in politics, just simply uh, to move up the ladder slowly, you might as well forget it. Yeah. Who are you really serving? I think in that context, one of the things that does strike me is the whole issue of truth telling and facts and evidence. It's almost like within this current culture of, um, without trying to sound too philosophical, where you know it's all about your truth. Uh, it's kind of the the postmodern idea that truth can be very relative or or dynamic, so to speak. But in this environment of polarization and conflict, it seems like we're we're being challenge to be unified in working together as a team for the interests of our country. And I think one of the key variables has been the media, quite frankly. And uh, how important was it to have a solid set of, frankly, media partners who could really work as as good, solid journalists uh, as you looked at the, the story of turnaround in New Zealand? Well, I think uh, over the last 30 years, well, in the 80s or 70s probably, there were the people who were working within the the press gallery in Parliament. They were some very good journalists uh, mm. in there. But also, it's changed a lot. You know, uh, it probably I'm not telling you anything. But in the seventies, the New Zealand Herald, which is the main uh, newspaper in New Zealand. Um, they would have one or two pages that reported on Parliament. Sometimes they were reporting the speeches, other things that were going on. Um, today, virtually nothing. And my, my, my press officer uh, in the 60s had been with the Christchurch Press and uh, Bevan Burgess was, uh, you know, a powerful figure in his own right. He, he understood PR, he understood uh, what people uh, and was important in the long run, and he certainly taught me a lot. In Canada, I'm not sure to what extent this is on the radar in New Zealand, but it has been really quite a revelation, the so-called Twitter files, that um, so much of the social media has been systematically controlled by in this case, U.S. government uh, agencies, both paying them and censoring them. It's really quite disturbing. But also in Canada itself, we have some 2,000 media outlets that are are uh, subsidized in addition to our state broadcaster, the CBC. Um, are you concerned that, that the media has frankly been so controlled by these vested interests, these, um, these special interests as we've referred about earlier? Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me, really. Uh, I think uh, in New Zealand we have a situation. You take the New Zealand Herald. Um, there's virtually none of the reporting that went on in the 60s and 70s, uh, um, unless it's uh, juicy and, you know, uh, they're not interested. And that's tragic. Wow. So it, it begs a lot of serious questions, doesn't it, about how COVID-19 was managed so that, frankly, this doesn't happen again around the world. So as you look at then the world context, um, and I know there's so many themes I could ask you about, but one is the whole World Economic Forum. And it almost seems that there's a set of movements, competing movements going on in the world um, without generalizing too much. But one is focus more on nationalism or accountability, the notion that people want to be in a community, a democracy, if you will, where people have a vote and control, frankly, over their destiny. On the other hand, you have a kind of a world movement. And of course, we need international cooperation. But there's this the so-called globalists who are about, uh, frankly, moving a lot of authority to an international level. Do you think that kind of global movement is a healthy one then for democracy and for people to be empowered to make the choices to live their lives the way they see fit? Um, probably not. I don't. Uh, I think uh, each country should be running itself to the best of its ability. If they want to uh, form an alliance with uh, and an association with another country, 
so be it. But to me, um, it's more about domination than than helping others. Quite Indeed. Often. So we would share that concern. Um, so the other side to my questions relate to um, so-called modern monetary theory, and I, I, I suspect that concept was not even heard of in the 1980s, to my knowledge. But this whole notion is that money is almost um, endlessly growing on trees, and that mm. deficits really don't matter. Our prime minister is quoted wildly, um, pardon me, widely as saying deficits or the budget can balance itself, implying that deficits really don't matter. I guess what strikes me about that is that it almost leads to an inevitable path where politicians can use your money and they can't resist using it to buy your vote. So has is that kind of almost absurd theory of economics got us into a mess that we're in now where so many governments are almost teetering on the financial edge? Um, I would say yes. Um, look, uh, if I look at New Zealand today, we are in deep, deep trouble. And the reason we're in deep, deep trouble is that we don't account for our debts in a proper way. And mm. I think a whole lot of countries, and New Zealand is in, in deep trouble, I would say as much as we were in the 80s, because we have unfunded liabilities which are massive and we don't record them in the books of accounts. And I think most countries don't. And I'm talking about the debt that we owe to the retired uh, or the soon to be retired for health and um, pensions. And they are massive. Well, I mean, in New Zealand, uh, we've got unfunded liabilities um, of uh, over a trillion dollars, and you know, the, which is about three hundred. It's about three hundred percent of New Zealand's G GDP, and that's been the case for a long time. It's why I actually formed that because I could see uh, difficulties down the track. But the politicians don't want to know about that. Um, and they don't account for it. If I'm a public company and I do not account for those liabilities, then as a director, I'll probably be thrown in jail. And yet the government can ignore it or the government um, decides to ignore it. And we're in deep trouble. We had the fiscal long run fiscal forecasts uh, for New Zealand, uh, which was published a year or so ago, um, uh, for 19, no, 2021 to 2061. And they showed that New Zealand is a huge financial problem because the ratio of the retired to the workforce is changing so dramatically. And it showed that, um, our, we're going to have a fiscal deficit of 13.3%. If we go on without change, of course it won't happen, we'd have a fiscal deficit of 3.3%. We'd have debts of, you know, of, of, and, and which are huge. Now, are we going to do something about it? Doubt it, because it, it doesn't suit the politicians. They're all short term as you talked about and wow. uh, i think i think that's a problem for a lot of countries well sir roger my observation would be it sounds like you're describing canada and uh, so many other western nations as well and and it's almost like a i don't know if you've you're familiar with the term a ponzi scheme um oh, yeah. it's like a pyramid and don't it's worry. going to, yeah. yeah so when does this all come to an end when does it um, it's starting to come to an end now. Well, I mean, in New Zealand, they're saying it's going to start to hit in around 2030. Mind you, Treasury doesn't talk about Ponzi scheme or anything like that. They're actually saying we're, we're looking reasonably good at the moment. But 
but they also point out that by 2061 we'll be broke. You know, if you look at the numbers, they don't use those words, but exactly Ponzi scheme pyramid. I've given Peter a paper today. I've just sent it to him that I've been writing on New Zealand uh, about the troubles that we're in and what we've got to do to get out of it. And it comes back to what we've talked about already. If we're going to get out of it in New Zealand, if we're going to create a situation where, um, you know, we don't have a fiscal deficit of 13.3% of GDP, et cetera, and all the other things that go with that, we're going to have to change. And the first thing we have to do is get rid of privilege and slowly over the last 30 years, a lot of privileges come back. We remove privilege and then we decide how we um, use that money in order to fix the problem. And so I've given Peter a paper. So if you want to read it, um, you're welcome. Well, that publish. sounds very good. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, at Frontier that we can share that with um, uh, with a much broader audience because we are, as we look to the future, our current state of affairs, we do need to uh, turn the corner on these issues. And, and it, might be really interesting to, it might be interesting to take my paper and put the Canadian numbers in and we could compare where we're at. I think that's a, a great suggestion. I, I think it frankly raises the question, just as we can build great countries we can also lose them. Is that right, Sir, Sir Roger? Oh, well, exactly, yeah. And, and you know, you've got politicians. We took, we had John Key as our premier here for nine years. He was conservative premier, but he was driven, you know, largely by the poll. In my 50 years in politics, he was probably, careful, the best politician I've ever seen, you know. He could work a crowd, he, uh, he could communicate. He was one of those people, the public trusted him, who could have done almost anything, but he elected to do nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, the- and uh, why? Why would you do that? Why was he in politics? And uh, to be loved. Maybe he was for a long time. He was certainly great at, at, at the game, but it's hardly a game, is it? No. And it's not about the politician. It should be about serving the people. And and Absolutely. so on that note, I, I did want to, as we get kind of the end of our discussion, um, we've covered a lot of ground from the history of um, New Zealand uh, to, to the lessons learned from reform to reflecting on some of the, the key themes that almost seem to be repeating again today. Um, what would you say is the legacy that you've left as you reflect on those 50 years within the political realm? Well, I, when I got the left politics or parliament in 1990, I hoped I'd um, created some lasting changes. And that's true, some of the policies are still there and it's lucky they are because uh, they're helping us move forward. But in the end, we're going backwards because politicians are coming in and, uh, and, and their, their interests are the next election, uh, not what's good for the country. And, uh, you know, you, at the end of the day, You've got to elect and and get more politicians in who want to do what's good for the country, not rather than themselves. And I don't think we are attracting um, people into politics uh, that um, will do that. Uh, well, we certainly are not in New Zealand. We're, we're attracting, uh, frankly, the people who are standing are more likely to be the ones that you described, you know, the ones who've come up through the system, go to university, um, work for a political party, and and then become a representative. Uh, And there are 
they're more likely to be what Mike Moore called seat of himself, I'm tribal. In other words, Labour, right or wrong. And we don't so, need that. Th that's very well said, Sir Roger. And so as we wrap up then, if you were to give advice to citizens in Canada, New Zealand, frankly, anywhere around the world, what action should they be taking to help move positive change forward that actually serves the people and not the world of vested interests and privilege? What would you, what would your advice be? Look, I think they've got to start by asking themselves, um, will the existing political parties um, actually change? Or do we need uh, a new party? Or do we need to find a way to inject uh, people of real talent and guts into the existing parties? Now, you know, there's all those options. Uh, the small parties, do we support, support the small party? But first of all, you've got to look at what is that party saying? What are the parties that are offering individual New Zealanders, Canadians choice, uh, who are creating an environment where there's competition in, uh, throughout, you know, society? Because competition within government is just as important as it is uh, in the private sector. But do we have competition in, in government? No. And we should have. Why, why can't we? Uh, health, I don't, I don't know, takes uh, 7 or 8, 9% of GDP. Why can't we have competition within health? Why does it have to be as bureaucratic as it is? Do you actually need a health department? Probably for some, you know, global things. But you don't, we, you don't need a, a monstrous uh, education department, that's for sure. Sir Roger thank Douglas, thank you so much for joining us today. Friend of Frontier and former finance minister with New Zealand and instrumental in the turnaround of that nation. and. Thank you so much for joining us today and reflecting on the lessons learned. We so much appreciate your courage and your leadership. My pleasure. Well, that be, that uh, brings to a close uh, our program today and our discussion with Sir Roger Douglas. We hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we look forward to our next program. Be sure to check our website at www.fcpp.org. And remember, without open discussion, you're not thinking and nor are you free. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.